Let us start the 34th session of Secrets of Spirituality. In the previous session, I was discussing these points or tips. And uh, today I want to tell a little more about the last point. Study the spiritual books, comprehend the nature of the self and be aware of your higher spirits. I have already given you a big list of spiritual books and a much bigger list is already present in our website also. You can go through that. And I have been telling about the necessity of self-realization and that way comprehending the nature of the self that is also possible if you follow all these instructions. Regarding the last point, be aware of your higher spirits. I just want to give an example. That is why I started with this slide only. One or two centuries before, there was a great Swami in Tamil Nadu area. Whatever you call it as Tamil Nadu now. He was there at an area near Vadalur. His name was Ramalinga Swamigal. This Swami was a great meditator and he used to live in a small hut. And he used to keep on telling people that you have to be vegetarians. You should not consume meat. And day in and day out, he used to keep on advising people that you should, you should stop consuming meat and you should stop all your other bad habits as much as possible try to live a virtuous life he used to advise people regularly even today in Vadalur there is a temple that is called Arupirunjyoti temple inside the temple there is no deity there is only a burning fire the burning fire itself is being worshipped inside the temple. And in front of the temple, there is a big board. Enter into the temple only if you are a vegetarian. That is the board in front of the temple. That means meat eaters are not allowed inside the temple. This temple was built based on the teachings of Ramalinga Swamigal himself. Because that was the first thing he was uh, advising to everybody around. There is a movie in Tamil called Arutpiran Jyoti. Those who are interested can watch this movie also. That movie is about Ramalinga Swamigal only. So this Ramalinga Swamigal used to keep on teaching spirituality to some of the aspirants. But basically he was advising all the public to live a virtuous life. But one day he thought there is no use in teaching these people or advising these people. The people are not going to change that way. So he became dispassionate about these people and he went back to his hut one day and he stayed inside the hut only. He did not come out. One day over, two days over, three days over. In general, people used to see him walking around the village. But people did not see him for one day, two days, three days. Gradually, people came to know that Ramalinga Swamigal has become angry on them. And after fourth day or fifth day, people started accumulating themselves in front of the hut of Ramalinga Swamigal. And they thought that he will come out of the hut. The hut's door was closed, but nobody had the daring to open the door forcibly. Because even though the people did not follow his teachings, people were afraid of his nobility or people uh, were afraid of his yogic powers. So people did not try to break open the door also. And they did not want to disturb him also because they knew that he was a very serious meditator. People kept on waiting. 
more than a week outside the hut of Ramalinga Swamigal. That area was uh, at that time ruled by British. So gradually the local British commander came to know that this is happening here. He came horse riding near the hut of Ramalinga Swamigal wherever people had accumulated. Now as Ramalinga Swamigal had not yet come more than a week, this British commander thought he must have been dead inside the hut and these people are afraid to open the door of the hut. So this particular commander ordered his soldiers to forcibly break open the hut. But when the soldiers tried to approach near the hut, all of the people accumulated there saw one violet light coming beneath the door of the hut and that violet light is simply merging in the space around. Even the British commander did not understand, nobody understood what is this violet light which came out of the hut and then it is simply disappeared. However, British commander ordered his soldiers to break open the door of the hut. When they broke open the door, there was nobody inside. There was no physical body of Ramalinga Swamigal himself. This Ramalinga Swamigal was a great yogi who had yogic powers and he had transformed his body into rainbow body. In the Tibetan method of yoga, there is a specific method of meditation called rainbow body meditation. That is a very high level tantric meditation where physical body can be transformed into light body or energetic body. So that is what Ramalinga Swami exactly had done. He had transformed his physical body itself into rainbow body and that is how the color of the Sahasrara Chakra is violet color and that is how people saw violet color light going out of the hut. That is how Ramalinga Swami girl had left this earth plane. That is when the British commander came to know that he was a great yogi and the phenomenon whatever happened there people could not understand actually. You can read such instances in the famous book Autobiography of a Yogi where Mahatara Babaji himself had physically appeared with Lahiri Mahashaya and even with Paramahamsa Yogananda as well. So these are the great spiritual masters. Now the story does not end here. I attended one course called Simplified Kundalini Yoga which Maharshi Vedadri formulated and I had met Maharshi Vedadri. In fact, the very last session of that particular course, at that time we had seen Vedadri and Vedadri had given a lecture or a small speech for our batch as well when we were there at that particular Arutparunjyoti Nagar. He had kept his kept the name as Arut Parunjyoti Nagar only, which is near Aliyar Dam. Why he kept the name Arut Parunjyoti Nagar? The reason is, Maharshi Vedadri was earlier very poor. He was a weaver and he used to sell idlis also. He had a very poor lifestyle at that time. And he did not beget any children also. Somehow he was living a noble life only but after a few years suddenly he started getting inspiration from within to compose poems in Tamil. All these poems were spiritual poems in Tamil and uh, Vedadri himself did not know how come this talent came from within and he did not know how suddenly he got an inspiration 
to compose poems. But he kept on composing so many poems. Very beautiful Tamil poems, all about spirituality. And uh, gradually, even Maharshi Vedadri had an inclination to meditate. So he used to sit for meditation calmly and quietly. And one day, he was actually thinking about how I got this ability to compose poems. In a during meditation itself, he was thinking. Suddenly, he got a communication as if it was a voice speaking to him. That communication was that I am Ramalinga Swamigal. I am using you as my channel for completing the left out work which I could not complete when I was in the physical body. So, I wanted you to use me as a channel and it is me who is inspiring you to compose all these poems. Maharshi Vedadri became so happy that he had a contact with the high level spiritual master. Maybe at that time Maharshi Vedadri did not know who this Ramalinga Swamigal was. He had to find out who this Ramalinga Swamigal was because Ramalinga Swamigal had left his body centuries before. Now Maharshi Vedadri has also has left his body. But when Maharshi Vedadri was there here, I think I have told you earlier about his astral traveling experience which I have personally witnessed when I was attending the classes in Bangalore itself. I think I have told you earlier about it. So, this country India is blessed with so many such great spiritual masters. And today I have told you about one great spiritual master called Ramalinga Swamigal. And even I have not yet visited Vadalur till now. I have a great ambition to visit Vadalur in the near future. If you people are willing, you can also accompany me at that time if you keep in touch with me till then. I have made it a point that every year we will have to visit one holy place and whichever holy place we choose, there must have been a spiritual master earlier or at least there must be a spiritual master now also. But the second option is difficult. The spiritual master remaining now is questionable because we really don't know who is the real spiritual master in this commercialization of spirituality. Everybody is a guru nowadays, so we really don't know who is really divine, who is really spiritual. As I've been telling in Kannada, Sharanaragunamanna Maranandalli Kanu is the proverb which is in Kannada. So we really don't know who is the spiritual master because the true spiritual master will not come to the limelight when he is in the physical body or when she is in the physical body as such because they will not market themselves. In fact, it will be the reverse where people will keep on troubling them more. That was what happened with Ramalinga Swamigal now. Even though Ramalinga Swamigal was advising people to live a virtuous life, they did not live at that time that way. They were troubling him basically. And now also people have not changed that way, right? So only when they leave their body, that is when other people realize how holy those masters were, how great their lifestyle was. I have told you about the life story of Santa Ekanatha also. So in the present scenario, we really don't know who is the true genuine spiritual master. So I have made it a point, we may not be knowing who is the true genuine spiritual master, but at least we know who were the true genuine spiritual masters earlier. So I have made it a point, once in a year, let us visit all those holy places which are in and around us only, they are not far away also. Most of these places are just one night's journey from Bengaluru. So, that way at least we can be keeping ourselves happy by visiting to Vadalur, visiting to Kalati, 
visiting to Pajaka, visiting to Melukote, visiting to Basavakalyana, visiting to Ulavi. Right. Visiting to Pondicherry also. Visiting to Thiruvannamalai, where real genuine spiritual masters had lived earlier. So someday I have an ambition to visit the Vadalur temple. And remember, the board in front of the temple is having this message, entry only for vegetarians. So that way we should respect the intention of Ramalinga Swamigal. When Ahimsa Paramo Dharmaha was told by Mahavira Tirthankara, without knowing that maybe Ramalinga Swamigal put it into direct practice and he advised others to live that way in and around Vodalur. I wanted to tell this in detail. That is why I started this session with this particular slide only, especially for the last point. Let me continue now. In any area in life, there are basically these three stages of success. The initial stage is always an exciting phase and the effort is a daring effort and the process is a learning process. But when gradually it progresses, the middle stage is the testing phase and the effort will be the desperate effort and the process is a practicing process. Many people want to get into the spiritual path. So initially it will be quite exciting when they buy some yoga mat or they buy some books and they will have a daring effort because they are learning. But after a few weeks or a few months, they will gradually shift their interest because they expect a lot of results out of their practices. When they don't get such results, they think this may not be worthy. That is one thing. Second thing is, they will get stuck with their other materialistic priorities. And when other things become a priority, they simply slide line all these practices. So the middle stage is the testing phase where the effort is a desperate effort and the process is a practicing process from learning it has to become practicing now the final stage is a perfecting phase where the effort is a determined effort and the process is a training process which means out of so many people who are coming into the path many will leave this path in the initial stage itself whether it is spirituality, whether it is any other domains where people have to become successful. Some of them will reach to the middle stage and gradually at that time also, they will also leave this particular spiritual path after the practice. To some extent, they will think this much is enough for this particular lifetime. Now only few ones who are quite determined they will get into the final stage where they are getting into a perfecting phase and later on they can actually train others also. Whatever they had learned earlier, maybe a few years before and they have practiced it for a few more years, they can later on involve themselves in training others. In fact, training is very much required for the next generation or for the present generation. Even in the spiritual path, continuous training is required. Training is required for anything and everything nowadays. But especially for the spiritual path, training is very much required. Well-planned training is required. Guidance is required for the people to live a noble life or the people to have realization of the self. Even I did not know that I am going to become a trainer in future when I was learning and when I was practicing. Maybe it was God's will that situations came that way and I started also training people. 
I did not start training intentionally, but somehow it started almost 20 years before and it has been going on. And in these 20 years, I have learned a lot and I have been guided in so many ways by means of many invisible hands, I should say, because I did not really search for any of the resources. But automatically, I was connected to many of these resources in one way or the other. That is why in the last session I told, there is a law of psychic attraction working at the background. Whatever we are deeply thinking about, whatever we are deeply interested in, in one way or the other, we get attracted to such people or we get attracted to such places or we get attracted to such situations and gradually, Learning also will happen, practicing also will happen, training also will happen together. Even today I am a learner only, I am a practitioner only, even though people consider me as a trainer. So these are the three stages of success, not just for any other domain, it is very much that way even for the spiritual domain. However, this is applicable for any domain in life. What is goal? G-O-A-L goal. Gaining overall achievement in life. This is recap for you. I think I have told all these things earlier also. I am repeating it again. There are six areas in life. Personal, relational, professional, social, intellectual, spiritual. Now, anybody and everybody will have this professional goal, which also relates to financial goal. But we should also have a personal goal. Means, if you look at your own face in the mirror, you should feel happy about yourself. Your eyes should not deceive you. You must be confidently be able to see your own face. That is personal goal. Relational goal, you should maintain relations with all your family members and friends. Maybe it is parents, maybe it is in-laws, maybe it is cousins, maybe it is brothers and sisters, maybe it is friends. All of us are social people, social animals. We will have to have good relations with everyone as such. So we will have to work out on how to maintain relational goals. Regarding professional goals, I don't have to tell you. The present education itself is making people professionals only. There is something called social goal. Let us say after a few years, once you become stable in your life, professionally or financially, can you be a little of contribution to the society around you? Can you be helping those who are deprived of some basic resources in life? I had told you about Islam's five great principles. Iman, Namaz, Roza, Zakat, Hajj. And I have told you about Zakat in detail. Now this is especially missing with the Hindus. Even though there is a ATG Act in the income tax rules that all donations are exempted. Now for that sake people should not donate just to have a rebate in income tax. It is not just a financial help always. It can be help to the other deprived ones in many other ways. So can you be of help to society around you in whatever way you can? That is called social goal. Now beyond these four, there is an intellectual goal. There must be a query about the facts of life. And there must be a search for the absolute truth. There must be a study. There must be a practice. There must be an interaction. That is intellectual goal. Always human beings are evolved. And there has been a mental evolution happening. Apart from the physical evolution. And logic can always be developed. Knowledge can always be accumulated. The hidden areas can always be explored. 
more truths about life can be uncovered that is intellectual goal but finally everyone should have a spiritual goal in the sense ultimately what was the purpose of life what is the purpose of life what will happen after physical death and what actually is the nature of god what actually is the nature of soul what is basically mind these all should be understood so anyone and everyone are supposed to have a spiritual goal that was there many millenniums before in this land where vidya always used to be atma vidya or brahma vidya in the gurukula teaching was basically about the self about god vidya basically meant atma vidya and brahma vidya both are one and the same self realization and god realization are basically one and the same but after a few millenniums somehow maybe due to the increase in population maybe due to the influence of other cultures maybe due to the invasion of other people into this land the system of education got changed and the system of education totally became professional now again there is a need to have a spiritual education so that people can have a spiritual goal if all these six goals are met only then that g o a l gaining overall achievement in life is possible that overall achievement means realize all these six goals but the pitiable thing is that most of the people are involved only in the professional goal professional basically financial now if they ignore the other five areas whoever do not want to have a financial success they will always have only financial success they will lose out with all other things people who keep on going after earning money they will only have money but they will lose out with all other things that is where people have to take a firm decision just like food when it is excess is going to be harmful money when it is excess is also going to be harmful unless it is utilized in the social goals if money is utilized along with the social goals at least it can be a contribution to the society my guru's another guru called maharshi amara my guru narsim murthy's one guru was dr swami geetananda giri from whom he learned ashtanga yoga my guru also had learned one more special type of meditation called saptarshi marga and for that his guru was maharshi amara but this maharshi amara was earlier called raja amrish verma he was from gokak district he was a very rich person at that time itself but he never showed that he had that much of material wealth my guru used to keep on telling me that his guru used to call all the students to his house on sunday and the guru himself used to cook food for the students and he used to serve them lunch and whole day they used to have spiritual interaction spiritual initiations and they used to come back home with lot of gratification it was one sunday class every week where they had a direct interaction with the guru and the guru even though he was a millionaire he used to remain so humble because he had already met social goal intellectual goal spiritual goal along with the personal and relational goal if money is utilized that way then it is worth it provided the people who are successful in professional goals they also should be having other three goals which are mentioned below you already know about sudha murti and narayan murti 
द फाउंडर ऑफ इंफोसिस इवन दो दे आर बिलियन ईयर्स नॉट मिलियन ईयर्स दे आर बिलियन ईयर्स बट यू नो इन वॉट वे सुधा मूर्ति हैज कॉन्ट्रीब्यूटेड टू दी सोसाइटी नाउ दैट वे इफ द मनी इज यूटिलाइज then even money earning is worth it otherwise people who go after money they will only have money in their life they will not have anything else they will lose out of the other five areas so people have to seriously think about how to have overall achievement in life by having all six areas for goal setting life stands for living in further evolution i have told you about the physical evolution i have told you about the mental evolution now there's a requirement for spiritual evolution in the sense we are physically evolved all the human beings are having fit physical bodies and we are mentally evolved we know how to use the materials on this earth for technology and for science and for engineering and for medicine and even for space research we know how to use all the materials on this earth for our own purposes so there has been a physical evolution there has been a mental evolution now is the need for spiritual evolution and for self realization that is why life stands for living in further evolution faith stands for faith actions thoughts environment faith on yourself faith on the self based on that actions happen now actions produce thoughts thoughts produce actions again thoughts are dependent on the environment in which you are growing up or you have grown up or right now whatever is your the surrounding environment around you the environment is going to induce thoughts based on the thoughts there will be actions based on the action there will be your faith system on the environment so basically faith is faith actions thoughts and environment nothing else nobody's faith is written anywhere of course in the karma theory there is something called sanchita karma there is something called prarabdha karma there is something called agami karma i am going to tell about it later but by means of spiritual education even karma can be reversed even sanchita karma can be erased sanchita means basically stored one the stored memory can be erased by means of meditation that way even if the previous life's karma is coming into this life that can be reversed by means of spiritual practice by means of faith on the self that way nobody's fate is written as such maybe to some extent fate is dependent on previous life's memories or previous life's imprints but if that can be refined if that can be purified then fate is in your own actions your own thoughts time stands for the infinite moment of energy i have told you this many number of times now for the practices do you have time or not people keep on saying we don't have time we don't have time we don't get time but i have been telling you that everyone is having this 24 hours only in a day this is what i learned from dr bharat chandra he used to tell in his workshop that everyone is having only 24 hours in a day how we use it is up to us so this question i have put here not for people who are listening to me online actually this question i have put for those people who used to come to me for offline classes not just for past tense even for future tense even for present tense even for the present offline students i keep on asking this question when they say we don't have time then i say don't you have time 
assuming let us say 100 years of age let us assume that we all practice yoga well and let us maintain good health and assuming let us say we live 100 years of age leave out the first 25 years for childhood and adolescence because it goes to school the child goes to school the child goes to college let us leave it first 25 years until the child becomes an adolescent and then adult leave out the first 25 years and leave out the last 5 years for old age maybe when you attain 95 years age later on maybe you are bedridden you may be weak let us leave the last 5 years at least now you are left with the 70 years of life provided let us say we all live for 100 years of age now the 70 years of life is totally 6 lakh 13200 hours okay 70 into 365 into 24 is 6 lakh 13200 hours out of these many hours leave out 20 hours every day let us say sleeping daily core profession petty work travel everything let us leave out this travel is daily travel for the place of work and petty work like going to shops or other things leave out 20 hours out of 24 hours you are left with four spare hours per day at least anybody will have four spare hours per day that is one lakh two thousand two hundred hours out of six lakh thirteen thousand two hundred hours this means that you have about 17 percent of spare time in 70 years right about 17 percent of spare time in 70 years now i conduct classes as junior and senior in the junior it is purely ashtanga yoga in the senior it is vedanta in the sense in the junior class it is more of practices along with some theoretical teachings but in the senior class it is more of theoretical teachings only less of practice because in the junior class itself nearly for one to one and a half years lot of practices have been taught for you people also i am going to teach later on you don't have to worry in this online mode the approach was slightly different where i thought let me conduct all these sessions in the beginning so that let people know what all is there in the spiritual science that is why initially it was for physical health when i presented art and science of eating later on it was for mental health where i presented healthy head and healthier mind now this is for spiritual health where i am presenting secrets of spirituality the approach of this online sessions is something different because the purpose was something different when I started this. But in the junior class, it is basically all the practices in four modules nearly for one to one and a half years. Now, this junior class, two and a half hours for one session, it is only on Sunday into 52 weeks, 52 Sundays into one year. I am considering the minimum time duration for this. Sometimes it goes on for one and a half years also. In general, it is one year. So it is totally 130 hours. Now, if anybody is coming to this junior class itself for learning Ashtanga Yoga, they are spending only 130 hours in their life for learning all these practices. That means, out of your spare time, you are sparing only 0.13% for attending junior class. That 130 hours is totally coming to 0.13% out of the 17% of your spare time. Okay. Next, if at all, those who are very serious aspirants, after practical sessions, they want to have theoretical sessions. Then for them, senior class is there that is actually planned for nearly five years but that five years may also become eight years or ten years or twelve years we don't know because at times there will be some delay there is an inadvertent delay when all the students 
do not follow all the regulations of this one man university this is basically a one man university where one person frames all the rules for the benefit of the students but all the students will not follow the rules of the university so what this one person takes a decision is until all the students fulfill all the norms the next module will not start because each module here is one year there are totally five modules each module here is one year sometimes that one year becomes one and a half years sometimes that becomes two years also that we senior class is for much serious aspirants it's a complete teaching in all other ways even in the senior class at the end practical sessions come again those are basically tantric sessions completely the sessions of tantra yoga to make people ready for tantra there is lot of foundational education required that is the intention of senior class whereas junior class is only for those aspirants who want to get a glimpse of yoga ashtanga yoga so that way if at all people continue to senior class it is almost 4 hours in a week again again on a sunday again 52 weeks because only on a sunday into 5 years approximately minimum duration that is they are sparing only 1040 hours in their lifetime for learning this now out of your spare time you are sparing only 1.02% for senior class that is when i ask the question to these people don't you have time when never we say people keep saying i don't have time i don't have time we don't get time you will not get time time is getting you why don't you understand that is my question people will not get time anywhere time is the resource which is actually making you aged time is going to take you away if you utilize the time that time is worth it otherwise time is anyhow going to take you away i should tell you one more small story now when alexander was here in india for conquering before coming all the way to india he had asked his teacher aristotle that i am going all the way and i am going to conquer india as well because india was famous even at that time for its material wealth as well as spiritual wealth so aristotle asked alexander what do you want me to bring from india to you aristotle told i have heard that in india at that time it was called as aryavarta or bharata in that land bharata i have heard that they have got a holy scripture called veda you bring me a copy of the holy scripture veda so alexander came all the way to india and i should mention bharata only he came all the way to bharata and he decided to go back he came all the way till sindhu river then he thought he has already conquered this land he thought after the sindhu river that is the end that is what he thought because at that time they did not have any gps system and he did not know that land still exists other side moreover his intention was to conquer india he thought he has come all the way now he wanted to take a copy of veda to his teacher aristotle so he asked somebody i want to get a copy of veda who can give it to me actually he did not ask he threatened people to get the information finally somebody told him there was a vedic scholar one great pandit he had a copy of veda at his home now alexander went all the way to that particular pandit's house or the scholar's house and he ordered him that my guru aristotle requires my teacher not guru my teacher aristotle requires a copy of veda and i came to know that you are having it and tomorrow morning i am going to come keep all your uh, 
Vedic uh, scriptures packed because they are all in the form of palm leaf scriptures. Keep them all packed. I want to take it away. Now a scholar asked, what if I don't give you? Now Alexander said, don't you know who I am? If you don't give whatever I wanted from you, I am going to execute you. I am going to completely burn out your scriptures and I am going to completely spoil your family. Now because of you, the whole people in the village will also be tortured. Now think about it. Whether you want to obey my orders or you want to invite trouble. Tomorrow morning when I come, I need all the Veda books packed and I want to take it with me. <coughs> So next day morning, Alexander came, this person, the Vedic Pandit, in the front yard, he had dumped lot of Vedic scriptures, all the Vedic scriptures he had dumped. And Alexander came, Alexander asked him, why have you not packed it yet? I have asked you to keep it packed neatly, you have still dumped it. Now. The Vedic scholar told, wait a minute, I will go inside and I will come out. The Vedic scholar went inside. When he came out, he was having a burning torch of fire in his hand and he brought that fire and he put that fire in the middle of this bunch of Vedic scriptures. And immediately all the Vedic scriptures caught fire and they were all burnt into ashes. Alexander became so furious. I wanted you to pack these books and give it to me. Instead, you are burning these books in front of me. How dare you? I am going to kill you now. I had told you yesterday. But the scholar told calmly, if you want, you can kill me. No problem. But you cannot touch these books. You are an arrogant fellow. You are a blecha. You are a killer. You being a killer, you being a mlecha, you have no fitness. You have no eligibility to touch these books. Forget about taking them with you. Whether Aristotle wants or whether anybody else wants. These books are not belonging to you now. I have burned them in front of you only. Now Alexander told him, are you not afraid of death? Because I am going to kill you now. Now the Pandit told, you can kill only my physical body. You cannot kill me as such. Now you have this physical power, you can pick up your sword and you can cut my head. You can think that you have killed me. But what am I? What are you? Have you thought about it? Am I the body? Are you the body? Do you know about it? Nainan chindanti shastrani, nainan dahati pavakaha, this is the shloka in the Bhagavad Gita. You think that if you want to kill me, you can only destroy this particular physical body or physical vehicle. You cannot actually kill me. I am a self-realized aspirant. So if you think you want to kill this body, welcome. Come here and cut my head so that I can be released out of this physical body at the earlier. I don't have to wait till the old age at all. Alexander thought this person is not afraid of death. How is it possible? Alexander had a similar interaction earlier with Diogenes. Now he is seeing another person here who could go to the extent of burning the scriptures as well. Now Alexander asked this person, okay, you are not afraid of death also, but you have burnt your own scriptures now, right? All the Vedic scriptures which you had, you have burnt it now. Of what use is it now? Now the Vedic scholar told, you don't have to worry about it. You gave me one day's time, right? When you gave me one day's time, I had three sons in my house. For all the three sons, for each son, I had taught the complete branches of Veda. For one, 
son Rigveda, for second son Yajurveda, for the third son Samaveda. I had taught them completely. And now, because you gave me one day's time, since yesterday till today morning, I have been revising all their learning. And when I was ensured that they have memorized each branch of Veda properly, I have sent them away from this house. And I have sent them, I have told them, go away from this village as early as possible, as far as possible. Go away. But take this knowledge inside your brain. So, even if I burn the books now, the way that I safe in my son's brains. Now, Alexander told, how is it possible to memorize? When you have written the scriptures, how is it possible to memorize? My dear friends, in the Vedic studies, there is a method called Ghanapatham. With this method called Ghanapatha, every Vedic mantra can be memorized. So, the very safe place to keep the Veda is the human memory. Because books can be burnt or books can be attacked by termites. Any other documentation can be destroyed. Floods may destroy the library also. Or the Nalanda University itself was burnt by the stupid, ignorant attackers. So that is when millenniums before saints had thought about it and saints had developed a mechanism called Ghanapatha. It is the systematic memorizing of the Vedic mantras. There are many such pathas. Samhita Patha, Krama Patha, Jata Patha, Ghanapatha, that way. Even now, there are people who are called as Ghanapathis. They follow the tradition. I should mention one name called Chalakere Brothers, very much belonging to Karnataka state. Even now their CDs are available where they have the Ghanapatha chanting also. So this Vedic scholar told to Alexander, do you think that only scriptures will keep our documentation? There is a method called Ganapata by means of which I have ensured my sons have correctly memorized the Veda. Now Alexander asked, what is the point in memorizing if it is not understood? Now the Vedic Pandit told, you being an attacker or a cruel person, you will not understand. First let it be memorized, later on let it be understood. At least initially let it be memorized. It will remain in safe in memory. Let it be memorized first. Then it will take a lifetime to understand the same mantra. Understanding can happen later on. But let there be preservation of the Veda inside the memory at least. My dear friends, because of this tradition of Ghanapata, even today Veda is pristine pure. Otherwise, all the scriptures, they have undergone some corruption or some other distortion, which in Sanskrit we call it as prakshepa. Means, somebody else will add something else into the same uh, literature. Whereas, because of this practice of Ganapata, since many millenniums, the Veda has been preserved in the same way. The mantras have been preserved in the same way because they have been preserved by means of this specific memory memorization technique where nobody is allowed to add anything else into the mantras. It is only a transfer from one person's memory to other person's memory and it has gone for centuries, it has gone for millenniums where there is a whole sect of people who are involved in memorizing. Maybe in the present age, such memorization is not necessary because now we have computers where everything can be stored and retained. But at that time, they thought that this is a boon for the humankind. So the Vedic scriptures have to be preserved 
inside the human memory. That was the great art of Ghanapatha which exists even now. Now Alexander could not say anything else. Alexander was thinking, what are these people? This person is ready to sacrifice his own life for the sake of preserving his scripture. He does not want me to take the scripture. And they have a method called Ghanapata where they memorize heavily. Thousands of mantras, lakhs of mantras are being systematically memorized. There is a Saswara Veda Mantra. Means Veda Mantra can be chanted by a particular Swara. There is something called Udatta. There is something called Anadatta. There is something called Swarita. By means of a specific pronunciation, the mantras can be memorized. So that is a great art of memorizing the mantra, chanting the mantra, then understanding the mantra. Alexander was thinking that he has achieved success. Now Alexander lost one more war in front of a Vedic scholar. That was a spiritual war. Alexander went back empty-headed. He could not take any Vedic scriptures. Now think about it. How much time would I have been utilized by these Vedic scholars to memorize the mantras? Now how can anybody say that they don't have time? This is my serious question to everybody. When people say they don't have time, then I ask them, then what for you have time? If you cannot spare 0.13% for attending junior class. Now let us say you are still more aspirant. If you cannot spare 1.02% for senior class, in spite of having your spare time, what are you doing with that particular free time? That question everybody should ask for yourself and you should find out the answer for yourself. Otherwise, anybody and everybody will be simply washed away by the floods of time. Now, don't you practice. People will further say, coming to class itself is a great thing, sir. They will say, for one year we have to come for your junior class. That itself is our great effort, sir. They will say. Then I ask them a question. If you come to the classes, if you do not practice later on, again that is of no use. You have wasted your time, you have wasted my resources at that time. So if you do not practice, let us say, practicing Yogasana for 30 minutes every day and for 6 days in a week utilizes 10,920 hours. That is 10% of your spare time. Remember? You had totally 17% out of which if you practice Yogasana 30 minutes every day at least for the physical health and for fitness, you are only utilizing 10% of your spare time. In addition, practicing Pranayama and Pratyahara together for 45 minutes every day utilizes 27,300 hours. That is 27% of your spare time out of the total times. 1 lakh 2200 hours. That is 17% of your 70 years. Now I am telling the percentage of these 1 lakh 2200 hours. Where you are using only 130 hours for attending junior class. That is 0.13%. You are utilizing only 1040 hours for senior class. That is 1.02%. Out of the 1 lakh 2200 hours which is the spare hour for you in your lifetime. If you practice 30 minutes of Yogasana per day, it is totally 10,920 hours. That is 10% of your spare time. Now, in addition, if you practice Pranayama and Pratyahara together, that is 45 minutes every day, that totally utilizes 27,300 hours. That is 27% of your spare time. Can't you spare a small amount of spare time for health, happiness and fulfillment? 
If you cannot, then you better get wasted by the time. What else should I say? Even after all these calculations, if people still say that they don't have time, in fact, many people came to these sessions in the beginning. Now how many are there? Now there are 50. Okay. Many people came to the session from the beginning and how many remained? That is the percentage. I showed you the table there in the beginning. Initial stage, middle stage, final stage. I had told you. Now that is where if people cannot spare a small amount of spare time for health, happiness and fulfillment, then those people are going to get wasted by the time itself. What else should I say? I cannot say anything else further. Be willing to give up what you are for what you can become. If you do not give up right now what you are, then you will keep on finding reasons for not doing whatever I am telling you to do. You will keep on finding excuses that you don't have time. Who has time? Tell me. Who has time? I keep watching the people around me. In the last few decades, how much time has been daily taken for their regular activities? I am just watching. Most of the people have enough time for social media communication. Maybe WhatsApp, maybe Facebook, maybe YouTube, maybe chit chatting, maybe phone calls. They have enough time. Maybe gossips. For all these, they have enough time. But when it comes to spiritual practice, even for attending classes, people will say we don't have time. After attending classes, people will say we don't have time for practicing also. What are they doing with the time? No, they are actually getting wasted by the time. They think that they are wasting the time. No, time is wasting them. So be willing to give up what you are for what you can become. If you will not be able to give up what you are right now, you cannot become anything. You will remain the same. Even in this life, even in the next life. Because the memory is going to be having a transference to next life. As Sanchita Karma. This life's Prarabdha becomes Agami. This life's Agami becomes next life Sanchita. So you are going to remain the same. If you do not give up what you are right now, you cannot become anything as such. This is a very great three sentences told by Eleanor Roosevelt. Great minds discuss ideas. Average minds discuss events. Small minds discuss people. Great minds discuss ideas about how life can be improvised, how health can be improvised, how realization can be achieved. Average minds discuss events. What happened there? What happened here? What had happened last year? This year 2020, since March, what all is happening here on this earth? And what may happen in future? They keep on discussing events. How tourism industry got collapsed. How so many industries got collapsed. How life has become a standstill in terms of business. And how there is a heavy financial loss. They discuss events. Small minds discuss people. How is he? How is she? What was she telling? What is he telling? What did she tell to you? What did he tell to you? And what should I, I tell to others? And in what way if I tell to others, in what way others will have influence and others will have my control? So this way, in what way I should please others? In what way others should please me? So they keep on discussing about people only. Great minds discuss ideas. Average minds discuss events. 
small mind discuss people all of them use the same time now all of them have the time for all these things for the great minds for discussing the ideas they use time which time spare time average minds for discussing events they also use time loss of a cricket match gain of a cricket match loss of a election gain of an election they keep on discussing these events all newspaper events they keep on discussing whatever comes in the headlines in the newspapers or whatever comes in the last pages also in the newspaper generally sports comes in the last pages politics comes in the first pages right so they keep on discussing these events using the same time now small minds discuss people also using the same time what do they do with the time is up to their character or to be precise what each person does with the time is up to what he or she has stored already in their own memory memory is part of karma with great minds there are ideas in the memory with average minds there are events in the memory with small minds there are only people in the memory and that is how all these three use their time for their own purposes karma takes its own course so where do you place yourself are you at the last line are you at the middle line are you at the top line you must decide i am already on the top line only in my mind i discuss ideas only but many times i discuss events also i discuss people also only for the sake of the ideas i do not discuss people for the sake of people i do not discuss events for the sake of events i discuss people because discussion is to happen with people only and using people only events have to be planned through events only new ideas can be implemented so for implementing ideas events will happen for implementing events people are required but can we keep on discussing only about people can we keep on discussing only about events from where the ideas will come for the ideas we have to actually utilize our time and in our mind we should develop such ideas along with intellect we must develop the ability of intuition yoga benefits yoga is not for the flexible it is for the willing you need not be flexible and as i have told you you need not be playing a russian circus or you need not be doing a gymnastics in the name of yoga that is not its purpose it is for the willing who can practice it so one obvious advantage or benefit is peace of mind it increases the arm strength by 12% after about 16 classes or 16 practice sessions less chance of heart disease because cholesterol is going to be burnt out slower breathing and less stress 35% increase in flexibility after 8 weeks of practice then decreases lactic acid in muscle and decreases joint pain of course this slide i have taken from the whole you university of washington whatever they have mentioned i am telling you in general i put a point here just so as to notice what are the benefits of practicing yoga now there is more oxygen to the brain because of the deeper breathing increases metabolism that means burns out all the nutrients into calories and increased lung capacity helps digestion grounded and better focus these are the benefits of yoga this is one specific asana named after my parama guru dr swami geetananda giri and they have named it as geetananda asana itself i don't know who invented this asana 
बिकॉज डॉक्टर स्वामी गीतानंद गिरीज लिनियज हैज थाउजेंड्स ऑफ ब्रांचेस ऑल ओवर द वर्ल्ड एज आई विल टेलिंग यू अर्लियर ही यूज टू से दैट ही डज नॉट क्रिएट डिसाइपल्स ही क्रिएट्स टीचर्स एंड ही हैज एग्जैक्टली डन वॉट एवर ही हैज टोल्ड ही हैज क्रिएटेड थाउजेंड्स ऑफ टीचर्स even now also in their lineage his wife and now his son they are creating teachers only all over the world they are not creating disciples so some particular teacher belonging to the same lineage or tradition may be discovered this particular asana and this is named after him only just to honor him they have kept the name as geeta ananda asana it is a variation of ardha chandrasana let me tell you some sayings of yoga maharshi dr swami geetananda giri let me share some of his wise sayings as in my second set of slides i had shown you the great sayings of mukundur swami now let me share some of the great sayings of my paramaguru Yoga is a scientific system of conscious evolution. Yoga is basically a science. It is the science of the body, science of the mind, science of the soul. And it is for conscious evolution, meaning people who really want to evolve, consciously want to evolve, evolve with the awareness. So yoga helps in such evolution. Yoga is the mother of all sciences. Yoga is the mother of all religions. Why he said that? He was a well qualified doctor who was practicing medicine for many years. But before that, he had learned yoga from his teacher. So he says yoga is the mother of all sciences because yoga reaches to the core of life. Yoga is the mother of all religions because whatever religions teach that is being practiced through yoga religions may be involved only in teaching no one may be verifying the practices but in yoga whatever is taught is being practiced that way yoga is the mother of all sciences yoga is the mother of all religions do not depend on anything outside of your own self yoga is the original science of self help whatever is required for the body that is already available within the body body has a much bigger consciousness to maintain itself the human body is a complete ecosystem by itself how do we define an ecosystem one particular part of nature which can function independently then we call it as an ecosystem for example we call a pond as an ecosystem because the pond can sustain itself whatever creatures are living inside the pond they can live inside the pond and they are all self supportive by the pond same way this physical body of human beings or even other living beings is a complete ecosystem in its own way whatever is required for the body is taken in and that whatever is taken in is also part of nature that is available and whatever is taken in into the body body knows what to do with it body knows what to keep within and what to eject out whether it is physical or whether it is air whether it is water whether it is food whether it is energy any which way so my param guru says do not depend on anything outside of your own self yoga is the original science of self help moreover the self is within the kingdom of god is within health and happiness are your birthright claim them spiritual realization is your goal pursue it he told health and happiness are your birthright you have to claim them means everyone is supposed to be healthy everyone is supposed to be happy moreover spiritual realization or self realization is the basic goal of life you will have to pursue it 
Watch the breath until you become the breath. In the Buddhist system, there is a method of meditation called Vipassana. Means keeping on watching the breath, not actually trying to control the breath. But with yoga, we control the breath also, we watch the breath also. In some method of pranayama, there is a heavy kumbhaka where we watch the breath. And through pranayama, if a kevala kumbhaka happens, then you are becoming the breath. In the sense, in the case of kevala kumbhaka, there is no puraka. <coughs> I'm sorry. Because of the cold season, I am getting the sneeze. You don't have to be alarmed. Okay. Otherwise, even a normal sneezing, normal coughing, he is becoming an alarm sign now. Bangalore is becoming more and more colder in this month of December. So, during the process of Kevala Kumbhaka, there is no Uraka, there is no Rechaka. Means, there is no inhalation, there is no exhalation, there is only normal retention. That can happen provided your body is much more energized by the practice of pranayama. It is possible that when the body has enough prana due to the continuous practice of pranayama, in some of these practices, even if you practice kumbhaka, you will not feel for a few moments or for a few seconds or for a few minutes, you will not feel either to inhale or to exhale. And that state is called kevala kumbhaka. And that kevala kumbhaka will gradually lead to samadhi. That is where my Param Guru says, watch the breath until you become the breath so that you attain kevala kumbhaka. There is only one secret in this universe and that is there is no secret. Everyone thinks spirituality is secret. Spirituality is not secret. Spirituality will be revealed only to the fit one. Spirituality will be revealed only to the eligible one. Actually, there is no secret. Water is not at all a secret to the fish. But fish does not put its effort in understanding water because fish is involved in understanding other fishes. In that case, if all the efforts of the fish are for understanding other fishes, how it can devote the same time for understanding water? Water has not kept itself hidden. Water is within, water is without. In the same way, there is only one secret in the universe that there is no secret at all. God is not at all a secret. God is completely open. In the Sharana philosophy, they say a particular word called Bayalu. Bayalu has two meanings. Bayalu means open ground. One more meaning of Bayalu means everything open, nothing is secret. Allama Prabhu has a vachana. Bayalu, bayalane bitti, bayalu, bayalane beledu, bayalalli, bayalagi, bayalayattaya. Nimma poojisidavaru, munnave bayaladaru, nanimma poojisi, bayaladinaya, guheshwara. Allama Prabhu says, I kept on worshipping you, O God, and I became open like you. You are also open. I also became open. Until then, I was closed. So, God is not secret. People do not have eyes to see God in life. They search for God everywhere else. So, there is only one secret in this universe and that is there is no secret. Continuing some more sayings of my Paramaguru. 
A Gurukula is a place where learning is by absorption rather than by superimposition of mundane knowledge. In most of the schools and colleges, it is the superimposition of mundane knowledge where whatever is there in the textbooks that is going to be forced on the students to study, to understand, to memorize and then to write in the exams, then to get the grades and then to get placed and later on to forget whatever they had memorized. That is what is happening in the present education, material education. So Gurukula is a place where there is no superimposition of mundane knowledge. In Gurukula, the learning is by absorption, by the gradual capabilities of the aspirant. It is not the chosen few, it is the few who have chosen. It is in contrary to the sentences that were told in some specific faith systems where they say those prophets were chosen. No. Gita Nandagiri says, it is not the chosen few, it is the few who have chosen. Those who have chosen the path, they are following the path. It is not that God is choosing somebody. God did not choose somebody as such because God has no such partiality to choose somebody. Okay. Water has no such partiality to choose a particular fish. It is the fish which has to choose to understand water or to talk about water, to teach about water. So it is not the chosen few, it is the few who have chosen. Dharma is the highest expression of cosmic truth. It is to know the reason for personal existence and to unfold consciously through experience back to cosmic state. That is what is called dharma. Dharayati iti dharma ityahuhu dharmo dharayate prajaha. Yatsyad dharana sanyuktam dharma iti nishchayaha. Dharma is the highest expression of cosmic truth. It is to know the reason for personal existence. Why are we here? Why am I here? I should pursue dharma to know the answer for the perennial basic question. Why am I here? And to unfold consciously through experience then back to the cosmic state. Let me go back to the source. From wherever I came, let me merge with the source. That which cannot be followed in day-to-day -day living should not rightly be called religion. That which cannot be followed in day-to-day -day living should not rightly be called religion. Which means that which can be followed in day-to-day -day living should be called as religion. Life is to be practical, simple, uncluttered, efficient, rewarding and enlightening. Anything in one's life that tends to confuse, distort or derange should be shunned as one's mental and mortal enemy. These are the real teachings of the Gita. Gita means Bhagavad Gita. His name was Gitananda. Life is to be practical, simple, uncluttered, efficient, rewarding and enlightening. So anything that is not helping to live in this manner, that should not be recommended to be practiced that way. Anything in one's life that tends to confuse, distort or derange, that should not be followed at all. In fact, in the Vedic Upanishads, there is one particular Upanishad called Prashna Upanishad, where Prashna means question. Question, answer, question, answer. That way, there is a direct question. Six people come to a Brahmajnani called Pippalada. And the six people ask one question each to Pippalada. All about God. And Pippalada answers all the six questions. That is called Prashna Upanishad. Now, there are some faith systems where they say, you should not question. 
Now those who say you should not question means they are distorting, they are deranging. Only by means of questioning we can try to find the answers. If questioning is not allowed then how can we believe the answers? So anything in one's life that tends to confuse, distort or derange should be shunned as one's mental and mortal enemy. These are the real teachings of the Bhagavad Gita. Even in the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna asks so many questions. For all the questions, Krishna answers. So there is a question and answer session only many times. How can some faith systems say that you should not question? So, when they limit the questioning ability, they are actually limiting the answering ability as well. You don't have a problem. You are the problem. <laughs> this is how Gita Nanda used to directly attack his students, so to say. Students who were supposed to become teachers later on. You don't have a problem. You are the problem. Each person is the problem. Otherwise in life there are no problems. People are the problems. People keep on saying there is a problem, there is a problem, there are problems, there are many problems. But what are these problems? All these problems are people's problems. That means people are the problems. Of course, there are other problems for which technology has found out answers, science has found out answers, engineering has found out answers, medical science has found out answers. Those are all the problems which came out due to the modern lifestyles. But in most of the families or in most of the societies, problems are existing because people are the problems. Persons are the problems. So Gita Nanda directly used to say, you don't have a problem, you are the problem. This is a table prepared by my Paramaguru's wife, Yoga Charini Meenakshi Devi Bhavanani, who came all the way from USA to learn yoga from my Paramaguru Gita Nanda Giri and she decided not to go back to USA. She stays in Pondicherry now also and she continues whatever her husband has been doing earlier. So she has made this particular table characteristic of science, characteristic of yoga. Is yoga science? Now characteristic of science is objectivity. Characteristic of yoga, there is something called vairagya, dispassionate objectivity. Second point, science, intelligent inquiry and careful detailed observation. Whereas in yoga, there is pariprasna or enquiry coupled with viveka or discerning intellect. There is always a questioning in yoga and there will always be an answer for any question. So, Yoga is a science. Third point, rigorous controlled experimentation is there in science. Whereas in yoga, there is a abhyasa. There is a systematic practice, which is nothing but experimentation with oneself. In science, there is a burning desire to know truth. Whereas in yoga, there is mumukshutva, burning desire for liberation. In science, it is a direct perception. Even with yoga, it is pratyaksha, it is direct perception. All the experiences are your own experiences. That means you don't have to believe on somebody else. Whatever is taught, you practice and that is your perception, which is direct. Science, correct knowledge or cognition. Even in yoga, there is a pramana, proof for the knowledge, which is accurate. Seventh point, reliable testimony from previous experimental work in case of science. 
Even in yoga, there are Vedas, there are Agamas, there are Upanishads. There is a parampara or a tradition or a lineage. And in all these scriptures or in the lineage or in the parampara, what is being told, what is being experimented, it is the testimony of the people who practiced yoga and they have transferred the testimony to the next generation. Each teacher has transferred the testimony to his disciples. So there is enough evidence about yogic experiences. I have already told you many of my own experiences to you. Eighth point, verification and repeatability of the phenomena is there in science. But even in yoga, there is this sadhana, individual experience to realize the reality of the teachings. Whether the Agama teachings or Upanishad teachings are true or false can actually be evidentially proved by means of individual experience. So yoga is basically science. This table has been prepared by Yoga Charini Meenakshi Devi Bhavanani. I am thankful and I am mentioning her name here. Ashtanga Yoga. Yama and Niyama is for social health. Asana and Pranayama is for physical health. Pratyahara Dharana is for mental health. Dhyana and Samadhi is for spiritual health. A great science where Patanjali classified within yoga practices themselves in this manner. Patanjali did not say Yama Niyama are for social health, Asana Pranayama are for physical health, Pratyara Dharana are for mental health, Dhyana Samadhi are for spiritual health. Patanjali did not say who said Dr. Ananda Bala Yogi Bhavanani said he is the son of my Paramaguru Dr. Swami Gita Nandagiri and Meenakshi Devi Bhavanani. They are his proud parents. He is their proud son. And he has two proud children. I hope the lineage will continue through the children as well. So Dr. Ananda Bala Yogi Bhavanani has told what Patanjali did not directly say. Which means, Ahimsa Satya Asteya Brahmacharya Aparigraha Shaucha Santosha Tapas Swadhyaya Ishwara Pranidhana These are Yama and Niyama and they are basically for social health. Asana and Pranayama is for the body along with the breathing that is for physical health. Pratyahara and Dharana are basically for the control of the sense organs and for the controlling of the mind, for attaining concentration, that is for mental health. Dhyana and Samadhi is basically for stoppage of the thoughts and then for attaining egolessness, that is for spiritual health. I keep repeating the same sentence again and you know already that what I am going to tell. I keep telling Patanjali is the greatest scientist on this earth. With that sentence, let me stop my presentation for today. See you tomorrow at the same time. Until then, take care and goodbye.